Welcome again, everyone. I see folks are still coming on in. So my name is Kate Hurt, and I'm a senior advisor with Adopt US Kids. So if you've come here today to learn more about intercountry connections and placements for our youth in care, you have come to the right place. Uh, we're really hoping today we'll provide in helpful information about the support services for placing kids with family when that family is in a whole different country. But we also recognize this can be a complicated process. So just know that more support is available to you after this webinar if you would like it. Just reach out to us, put your name in the chat, and we'll get you connected to the right folks. Next slide, please. So this webinar will be recorded. The recording will post on the Adopt US Kids website, and you will receive an email with a link to the recording and a certificate of attendance within a few days after this webinar. Shortly after the webinar wraps, you're also gonna receive an evaluation survey. If you can spare just a few minutes to share your feedback with us, that is super helpful. Um, we do try to continually improve the services and webinars we provide to you. Next slide. So as you hopefully already know, Adopt US Kids is a grantee of the US Children's Bureau with a mission to both raise public awareness about the need for foster and adoptive families and also to support states, tribes, and territories in recruiting, engaging, developing, and supporting foster and adoptive families. All of our services are completely free. It's an important note that presenting today is International Social Services or ISS, which is its own agency separate from Adopt US Kids and their services do have associated costs, which they can discuss directly with you. Now, inner country placement support is really a critical service and I know you're all eager to hear more. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to my friend, Elaine Wiseman with ISS. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, as Kate said, my name is Elaine Wiseman. I'm the Program and Training Manager at International Social Service USA. Um, I'm really thrilled to be joined today by my colleague and friend Renee Evelyn, who will introduce herself in a moment. Um, but she is really an advocate and champion for this work as well. And I am so indebted to her for joining me in many of these presentations and, and really being an advocate for this. So Renee, I'll let you introduce yourself briefly and we'll get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'm Renee Evelyn. I am a, an adoption field support supervisor here in New Jersey with the Division of Child Protection and Permanency. And Elaine, it's always my pleasure to do this work <laughs> with you. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Sure. Um, you can go to the head to the next slide. So um, today we're going to start by introducing International Social Service USA, ISS USA, as an agency, as an international network, and a nonprofit service provider. And we're also going to be talking more generally about international family finding and permanency planning as a best practice. Next slide. So we're going to start with some polls, um, and hopefully these are not too difficult. They're just from personal experience. And the first one here um, is to answer the question with yes, no, or I don't know if you've ever worked on a case where there was a family member overseas. Um, and I think, Megan, once you get, you know, 60, 80%, once responses start to slow down, you can close it out. All right, did we get any results on that? So 64% of you said you have, 34 said no, and 2% didn't, didn't know, or maybe didn't apply. So, okay, so a, 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 slight, a majority have, which is very interesting and, and very exciting for us. Um, go ahead to the next poll. So the next question is on an agree to disagree scale with the following statement, that the needs of children are better served in the US regardless of their family situation. And so we'll ask you to strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree. And we'll do the same thing, have Megan close out the poll once we get about 80% or so.
Let's see. Where did we land on that? So nobody strongly agreed that the needs of children are better served in the US. 11% um, agreed, 56% disagreed, and 33, about third, strongly disagreed. Great, so we'll go on to the, the last poll. And this question is again an agree, disagree question. The, um, so agree and or disagree with the following statement. I am confident in my ability to help find and engage with the child's potential family resources outside of the U.S. People answering the question. Let's see. I can see the I can see the poll. It's like there's low responses. Let's try maybe try it one more time. Oh, oh, it was there and just it just went away. But it looked from the quick flash that I got. Here we go. Um there is a higher percentage that disagreed or strongly disagreed. There we go. 46% disagreed and 34% strongly disagreed in their con that they were um, confidently able to help find and engage and 8% and 12% um, uh, respectively were in the strongly agree and agree. So more disagreement with confidence in finding and engaging with potentially family potential family resources. So I'll turn it over now to Renee um, to ask some questions about that. So I just have a question um, in regards to this particular poll. Is there someone that disagreed um, that in their ability or that strongly disagreed in their ability? Would someone care to share, whether it be in the chat or if they're permitted to take themselves off of mute, would you care to share why you disagree um, why you don't believe in your ability to help find and engage with a child's potential family resources? What do you think you're lacking that uh, would assist you um, with facilitating such a connection? I see never received in any training to, to address exploring international options for placement. Um, anyone else? And I have the resources out of country, language barriers. Okay. And for someone of the 8% who said that they strongly agree in their ability, why do you strongly agree in your ability? What makes you um, confident that you have the ability to engage with international connections out of the 8% that said that they strongly agree? She said, I work for ISS. Okay, Kelsey. <laughs> <laughs> that would make you, that definitely would make you confident. <laughs> Understanding the application of the Hague. Okay. It's difficult to find in another county, let alone another state and then another country. Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll, um, there are certain reasons why I engaged in that. So we'll get back to that a little later. Okay. Next slide, feeling. Thank you. Thanks, Renee. Um, and yeah, it's helpful for us to, to to hear a little bit about the why and understand how much of it is is resources, how much of it is knowledge. And I think we'll we'll end up talking more about that as we go through. But I wanted to start with just a brief introduction to ISS. Um, ISS USA, we happen to be based here in, in Baltimore, Maryland, but we are the U.S. member of the larger um, International Social Service Network, which, which has a headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, we have partners in about 130 countries, all of which operate slightly differently and autonomously. Some are independent nonprofits like we are, some are larger part of larger community-based organizations or international organizations. Um, some may be a, a, an office of the government. Sometimes they're an individual, so it can look very different. 
Um, all partners in the network are vetted through this general secretariat um, to meet the professional requirements and expectations of child protection standards in their country. Um, so all serve as the primary contact for ISS on our international casework, both going into their country and coming from their country. And through this international network, we coordinate services and, and help obtain services as part of permanency planning. And then we use that direct experience in case management to also provide technical assistance and guidance related to cross-border casework in lots of different ways. Next slide. Um, a little bit more about our work. So our mission in its most simple form is to connect cross-border families. We'll talk more about who those are. Um, but we do this in a few different ways. One is we coordinate the U.S. repatriation program, which is for vulnerable U.S. citizens who need to be returned to the U.S. Um, that's a federal program operated through OSEPR. I'm not going to speak too much on that, but some of the people, some of you today may know us more from that repatriation work. What I will talk about today is our intercountry case management program um, in much more depth. And that's where we're talking about connecting social service system to social service system, primarily in child welfare cases when there's an international component. We do have some specialty programs and small grants at different moments in time, including we've worked on the reunification of immigrant children after the previous administration's zero tolerance policy. Um, we've worked on programs related to the safe return and repatriation of uh, immigrant adults. During COVID, we helped um, develop some guidelines on the appropriate use and application of remote assessments in, um, in child welfare. We're currently working with UNICEF on a module for frontline social workers working with children on the move. Um, all of these are based on our direct work with cross-border case management. So you'll, there may be more of those to come. And then finally, technical assistance. Um, if you have a case that is does not necessarily meet one of our service criteria, we often offer um, guidance, resources, support to help you get to where you need to go. And then we also work on developing protocol and helping build capacity around this cross-border work. So there's a lot of ways that you can work with us in, um, in this kind of general area. Next slide. So since today is mostly talking about international case management and as a specifically as a tool in equitable permanency planning, I share this visualization just to quickly understand kind of what cross-border case management looks like. So we will receive referrals either from a U.S. child welfare agency or one of those international partners in the countries, those 130 countries. About two-thirds of the work we do annually is um, on behalf of children who are in the U.S. foster care system and have family in another country, and then the other third are those children in another country who have family here in the U.S. The key to all of this is that each case has a dedicated case manager, some of whom are clearly on, on the call, who takes on the coordination of the services, of the work, of the communication with international partners to complete the service, to obtain the service, to coordinate um, and liaise with you. We also do a little bit of um, interstate work where the ICPC cannot be invoked, um, specifically with non-custodial parents, but that's a topic for another day. If you have that need, you can message us directly. Next slide. So today we're, we're presenting ISS as a resource in support of international permanency planning, which we just kind of want to set out as, as a best practice. It is both federal law and best practice for states to exercise due diligence to identify and notify all adult relatives of a child in care. Um, it's not spe specified in fostering connections that a family outside of the U.S. should be included in that, but all adult grandparents and adult relatives would include those outside of the U.S. Um, there's also provisions in um, Family First Prevention Services Act to um, allow Title IV funds to go towards family preservation and prioritizing keeping children parents. This is not new to anybody, I'm sure, in this, in this group. Um, but also in this, in the more recent guidance that came through an information memorandum a couple of years ago, 
that's really asked us to perform these exhaustive and ongoing kin searches as part of a commitment to protecting and preserving a child's core identity, sense of belonging, language, culture, et cetera. So again, there's no mention of international family in that. And I, I think that is, is an oversight. Um, but as a core best practice, when we're talking about identity and culture and belonging and heritage, that has to include engaging with family outside of the US in some cases. Next slide. And so just to wrap up this intro and, and reiterate some of the points that Kate mentioned at the beginning, um, equitable permanency planning means helping kids find permanency with family wherever that family is. Um, we are one resource available to you or to anybody working towards that goal, not the only, um, but we hope we can provide some resources today. Our services are objective and impartial, so we never, ever, ever advocate for a child to be placed with family overseas until we know there are family that are that is safe and suitable uh, to take care of them. Um, really, our work is about getting objective on the ground information so that decision makers can make informed decisions. We are also reimbursable through Title IV e funds in many cases. I'm not an expert on this, so I encourage you to ask your follow up with your individual office as to how to do that, but many of our of these services are reimbursable. Um, we're also an open resource, so you do not have to have an existing contract with ISS USA in order to access our services. Um, we can take referrals from anybody. But as Kate mentioned, we are not a free resource and we are not a grantee of Adopt US Kids. Um, we'll talk more about fees in a minute, but there are, there are fees associated with getting the work done. We're also not affiliated with any government. So we're not the same as working with a consulate. Our services are not usually funneled through consulates. Um, we can't issue visas or travel document travel passes or um, perform the functions of a consulate. We can oftentimes help you work with them. Um, some of our international partners are government entities, as I mentioned, but um, and all of our partners do have the ability to work cooperatively with their governments. Um, but again, we are an, we're an independent nonprofit and not part of a, any government. And then an, an oversight here on my slide uh, that I noticed is that we are also not an adoption agency. And I hope I don't lose too many people with that, but we are, um, ISS is not an accredited inter-country adoption agency. And so we cannot provide home studies in the case where the case you're working on is going to an international adoption. Um, if you have questions about what constitutes inter-country adoption, I would go to the State Department website. You can email adoption at state.gov um, for adoption specific questions internationally. Um, but we do support interna international guardianship placements, support reunification with parents in other countries, work on visitation. Um, and like I said, there's lots of other kind of permanency options that we can support internationally, just not adoption. Next slide. Um, so now we've introduced ISS and permanency international permanency planning generally, and we're going to go into who are who are we talking about when we talk about children with international family. Next slide. So globally, there's about 280 million people living outside of their country of origin. If you recall, the ISS network, because of how many countries we are in, the our agency does a small fraction of the work done by the by the agency, uh, by the network, I should say. Um, so certainly not all trans cross border families and cross border casework starts or ends in the U.S. Um, but in the U.S., there's about 12% of our total population that has at least one immigrant parent, and for children, that's um, about 25%. So one in four children currently in this country have at least one immigrant parent. Um, we also know that every year there's over 100,000 unaccompanied minors who are released through sponsors, released to sponsors through um, the Office of Refugee Resettlement. We are not um, subcontracted by ORR, um, but we are seeing that at, in the case that those um, placements disrupt, many of those kids have the potential of ending up in state foster care, and we are seeing some of those cases come to us. 
Um, so kids who are released to a sponsor do not go back to ORR care. Um, they become, they go into state, would go into state care. Some of you all may be working on those cases as well. We also know that there are about five to eight million US citizens living abroad at any given time. Um, there's not great data on that, but it's a very big population of, of US citizens who are um, out of the country. So all is to say there's this huge population of people who have international family connections, whether as an immigrant, a child or grandchild of an, of an immigrant, or a family member of a U.S. service member, somebody working abroad, living abroad, studying abroad, retiring abroad. Uh, and we find that there are very few resources, as may, we may have seen in the polls, um, to help child welfare agencies understand how to connect those kids with, with families and support that they need. Next slide. And so despite the potential scope of this population there, we know there are also these immense barriers in family reunification when there's overseas family. Um, we conducted some exploratory research um, and I'm gonna soon pass it over to Renee whose research is much more reliable, um, but ours found that in general, there's this real lack of knowledge of cross-border inter or international placements, um, a lack of policies related to those placements, a lack of comfort in conducting diligent search for family overseas. And um, I think importantly, this perception that family court judges would not be willing to consider placement with a parent or relative, and that should say overseas. Um, that, that the international piece was kind of, we don't have judicial responses on that, but um, even the perception we think has an impact on, on in creating barriers. So next slide. And this is just one piece that I'll highlight from our research before turning to Renee. There was this very high familiarity with diligent search, family finding, ICPC. I think we saw it maybe in some of the comments about people feeling like they need more resources for, for locating um, family overseas. Familiarity certainly dropped significantly when looking at international cross-border placements. Um, and a lot of people said that it, international diligence search is not part of their regular practice, even with immigrant children. All of this, I think, begs the question that we pose there at the top, what factors drive permanency decisions when there's an international component? Uh, and I think we do have to think that this lack of familiarity and practice does, does have an impact on um, those decisions. So with that, we'll go to next slide. What we do and don't know about cross-border permanency planning, and, and this is where I turn it over to Renee to talk about, about her work. Thank you, Elaine. So I was lucky and fortunate enough to be a member of cohort four of the Adopt US Kids Minority Professional Development um, Leadership Program. And the subject matter that I chose for my action research project was actually the work that we as social service agents that we conduct um, with cross-border connections and permanency, or should I say the lack of. So what I did was um, I focused my work on how domestic cases are handled versus those involving international families, recognizing that, oh, I'm sorry, guys, Go to the next slide, please. I apologize. Next slide. Um, next one. Thank you. Recognizing that family connections in child welfare are limited due to biases. That is the number one reason why we don't put in the extra work um, internationally that we do nationally, which brings me actually to... Um, the poll question that we asked about that said the needs of children are better served in the U.S. regardless of their family situation. And I think there was a very, very high percentage that strongly disagreed or disagreed with that question. And I find it interesting that the percentage was so high considering the lack of work that we do as um, nationally to make it happen. Right, so I just wanted to um, draw reference to to that. So case practice is is weak. I learned during my research that you know the biases, the case practice, the recognition of the importance of keeping children or families connected 
regardless of where they're located. Um, it truly does happen. The decision makers, such as the judges, the agency directors, the policy makers, they need to be taught, not just to be aware, but some of them have to be actually taught about how permanency for youth can be obtained and how and the work that we need to do to ensure the success of those making sure those connections actually happen. So what I did was I used a survey. I looked at all of the cases during a three-year period that were referred to ISS from my state, which is New Jersey. I narrowed it down to the county that sent in the most referrals to ISS. And Elaine has previously indicated and will continue to tell you what ISS, the services ISS can provide. So that county happened to be Essex County, New Jersey. So I want you to know that the staff from Division of Child Protection and Permanency in Essex County actually represent the community they serve. Okay, the county is heavily, heavily populated by families of minority descent and the majority of staff members in Essex County um, are of minority descent as well. So with that, there is no barrier. Okay, so that definitely was not a barrier um, with doing the work. When we did, when I did the research, the trends that were identified um, in the review as to why staff members would be reluctant to do the work um, or to assist with a child relocating out of country, a lot of it had to do, some of it, should I say, not a lot of it, had to do with the comfort of the children being reunified with their parent. But con international connections is not just being reunified with a parent, right? Um, interestingly enough, the barriers identified most frequently were tasks within our control, such as the lack of documentation, meaning doing the work and documenting the results. The delay in getting the referrals to ISS, we had, there were some cases that we researched that we found that a child may have come into care now and we didn't do the referral to ISS until a year and a half, two years later, even though we knew that the child had family connections out of the country. We took our energy and put it in so much to working with what we had or did not have here that we delayed in putting in the referral. And the referral went in a year and a half later because at that point, all else had failed here when we should have been concurrently planning from the beginning, from the time the child came into care. Um, once we identified the area, again, there was 103 staff members um, that completed the surveys around the work we do or we don't do uh, with our international families. And I say that because we recently had a situation here in New Jersey where, and I was telling Elaine about this, where a mom, she is in the process of being deported and she's not being deported for anything that has to do with child protection, but her child is in care because she's in custody currently here. So my question to staff was, are we talking to her and letting her know that if she is deported, her child may go with her. Her child can go with her. We have no legal grounds to keep her child here because her reason for being deported has absolutely nothing to do with the harm of her child. So she has family in her country. She can plan for her child in her country. But those are the conversations that we're not having with her because in some of our minds, it's best for the child to stay here when in all actuality, is that factual, right? Um, and those are the questions that we need to ask ourselves. We need to ask ourselves as social service agencies, especially those of us that are involved in child protection. Um, I have the, the point up there, traumatized youth versus a successful adult. And that sticks out to me because we often talk about youth who remain in child protection for a lengthy period of time are more likely to become an unsuccessful adult, 
right? That's that's our belief. That's what we think will happen. If a child remains in the system, then the chances of them becoming a successful adult is a little, a little um, slimmer, right? But we also have to think about, are we keeping the child in the system away from their culture, away from their family, away from, you know, those connections that we can possibly build? And if we are, if we were to reverse that, would that help them becoming a successful adult? Would that help them know, know by knowing where they're from, even though they may not, they may not be able to be with family physically, that connection, those phone calls, those um, the video chats, you know, would that help them with the with becoming a successful adult? So it was evident in the review, we had 79% of our staff that agreed that connections and placements internationally would be beneficial for our youth. But we had 20% that said no. And that's a low number. That's a very low number. However, the reasons why they said no, the reasons why they said no was the issue, okay? We had reasons such as um, economy, standard of living, um, the education systems, um, no relationship with the family that they could possibly be going to. So my question when that came up during my research was, when we put a child in foster care, that child has no idea who that family is. Those relationships are formed. Those bonds are formed after the child is placed. So how can we use that as a reason, no relationship with the family? How can we use that as a reason not to put a child with family? Just because the family is out of the country. Poverty, poverty by whose standards? When we get our referrals back, and I'm an advocate for indicating, ISS does not make recommendations on whether or not a child can be placed internationally. ISS is the middle point, is the middle ground, for making their referrals. They get the recommendation back from that country, okay? So my question to social service workers that are using ISS USA, when you get your referral back and it says it is denied, are we just saying it's denied? Or are we now going back to the country through ISS and asking the question, what is it that we can do what services can be provided, what support can be added to make this possible for this youth. We do it all the time here. Here in New Jersey, we add on, we put additions onto houses, we buy uh, you know, vans, we turn vans inside out to accommodate our medically fragile youth. We do all kinds of things. We come up with all kinds of funds to make things possible here. Why don't we ask the same questions there? We just take the response that it's not going to work and we just drop it because in our, the back of our mind, those biases kick in that the child is better here, better off here. And that is unacceptable. Okay. So the level of adjustment, the length of play time the child has been in placement, but the length of time the child has been in placement with a non-relative, that could be on us because we're not doing the work that we're supposed to do in the beginning to get the child with relatives, even though the relative is out of state, right? Or out of country. So those were, that was just the basis. A lot of that is the basis for what my um, my project was about. And then it, um, I became involved in a case that, or should I say when I was going through my project, I, um, can you, next slide please. When I was going through my project, I became aware of a case um, where, next slide. Thank you. Isn't that picture so pretty? I love the Caribbean. <laughs> um, I became aware of a case of a little girl who um, was in foster care here in the US. She previously resided with um, one of her parents and the parent left and went back to Haiti for medical care. The, the parent left the child in the care of someone that they believed would care for their child, not thinking that it would lead to them being separated from their child for four years. 
And why? Because the agency did not do the work to help reunify the child with the parent. Not only did the agency not do the work, which includes getting the child a passport, taking the child to visit the parent that was raising the child, um, contacting the agency in that country in Haiti to see, you know, to get the ball rolling on reunifying because the parent left because the parent was going to be able to get free health care in Haiti. Parent could not get free health care here, which is why the parent left. So four years later, this child has only seen the parent via uh, WhatsApp, but not face to face because Wi-Fi in the area where the parent lives is limited. But did we offer to get ISS involved and get someone from um, social services in Haiti to drive the parent to a location where Wi-Fi is available? No, we did not. We just allowed the child to continue in resource care, bonding with a family, and then get to the point where we can't reach the parent. The mail we're sending to the parent can't be delivered. So this child now is going to be adopted by this resource home. And then we have the resource home saying, well, if we adopt the child, we're no longer going to um, connect the child with the child's birth family. That is all unacceptable. So, you know, work needed to be done. So there happened to be a worker from Haiti who was going to Haiti on vacation. And that worker was asked to go and drop some papers off to that parent. Well, the worker decided that was not all the worker was going to do. The worker got to Haiti, contacted the welfare department, contacted Child Protective Services, contacted the school system, found out what needed, what did this parent need for this child to come home. With that being said, the court system here got behind what was happening and decided not to allow the child to be adopted, kicked the case back to a reunification case and forced the agency to work with this parent to get this child back. Okay, so I'll give you a little update as to what transpired um, since then once Elaine uh, continues on. Hey, do you want to go to the next slide? This is kind of just a, a recap of a lot of what re points Renee has just made that we know family relationships are really positive and give uh, help support kids in a lot of different ways. And that really this is about the connection that matters, um, whether it's the domestic connection or an international connection, connections may look slightly different. Um, but it's it's really the connection itself that has the biggest impact on on kids. So you can go to next slide. And Renee, this one might be you. Do you want to do this one on on tips? I can. Yes. So these are just some points that I had pointed out in my um in my research. We we in no way, or I am in no way, advocating for us to just automatically as you know, child protective service workers or social service workers, I am, am in no way just advocating for us to put ch children in other countries, you know, and just place them, okay? We have to remember that safety and protection are paramount. I don't care where this child is or where the family is, we have to make sure safety and protection come first. Additionally, we're always focusing on the children. And yes, the children are our uh, priority. Children cannot protect themselves. They depend on us. However, let's keep in mind that when families are separated, whether it be parents and children or an aunt and a niece or a grandparent and a grandchild, the trauma, the adults feel the trauma as well. Not just the children, the adults feel it as well. Even if it is a parent and a child, even if the parent, you know, may have done some things where they at this time cannot parent their child, they're still separated from a child, okay? So we have to keep that in mind. It's not just the children who are traumatized, it's the adults as well. And nine times out of 10, the families who are inter out of the country, the family members, they don't know our systems. They don't know what's going on. They're sometimes only going by based on what their the family member, the parent is telling them. 
So we need to have those conversations, especially if a parent is producing family in another country. Do we just, we, we keep dropping the ball instead of pursuing that family member? International connections, just as important as domestic, just as important as domestic. Um, and the best interest of the child. So we know that in welfare agencies, we get, I say, a ch I call it a checklist. Okay, we get a checklist when we get cases that come across our desk, whether it be child protection, whether it be the welfare association, whether it be motor vehicles, well, no matter what we do, there's always a checklist. Okay, what I found a lot of times is that we're so busy checking off a box just to say that it's done, that we're not actually looking at what we're doing. We're not looking to see if it's right, if it's wrong, if it's done as thoroughly as it could be. We're just so interested in just checking off the box off of this checklist and saying that it's done. And I implore you to ask the kids that you're working about, the kids you're working with about all their family resources. Sometimes our kids choose their own placements. Our kids choose their own connections. Our kids come up with the basketball coach, the choir, the choir instructor. They come up with resources for themselves that we sometimes don't even know exist. And we need to have those conversations with our youth as long as they're, they're capable of having them. So next slide. So to give you an update, so the worker that went to Haiti, went to Haiti, did came back with all this information for the agency, produced the agency, gave the information to the agency. Five months later, child had an expedited passport. Child went to visit the parent for two days. And then two months later, child was placed back with, his, with the parent. Okay. Um, so all because of one particular person just asking the correct questions. Okay. So after four years, this child was reunified with the parent that was raising this child prior to a health situation. The only disappointment I have with it is, you know, we still have to be mindful. Yes, reunification was great, but we still have to add normalcy to our children, no matter where they're going. And I know for us here in New Jersey, if we're placing a child, you know, we used to say a lot of times the kids will show up at the door. If the kids are traumatized and they feel that every time they see their social worker, the social worker is going to move them. And sometimes we move our kids in garbage bags. So we started getting suitcases for our children. We started getting duffel bags for the kids to add some normalcy because they're not trash. So they shouldn't be taken out with the trash. Right. So the only thing that was a little troublesome is instead of, you know, possibly using funds and paying for 10 suitcases to be checked in at the airport, the child's belongings was sent in a barrel. Um, took the barrel two months to get to Haiti. And therefore the child was in Haiti for two months without the child's personal belongings. You know, they took the basics with them in the travel when they went to take the child to the parent, but this child, no, the normalcy was missing. So yes, the reunification was great, but to await your stuff to come in a barrel. Um, I'm from the Caribbean. We use barrels to send stuff home to our family all the time, but not to move a not to move a child home. It it and then the child having to wait two months. So, but the good thing is the work was done, took one person, the work was done, and the child was replaced with the, with the parent. All you as Elaine. Well, you can you can go to the next slide and we have um I think I love when Renee shares some of the per like the stories from that she's worked on and all of the ways that um it shows up in in New Jersey but this is an opportunity we thought too to bring some of you into um another case scenario with kind of less detail and give you the opportunity to reflect on how how some of this might come up for you in your own casework in your own case practice in your own agencies so of course, there's no such thing as a as a typical case, um, but we'll read this and kind of walk through some some next steps and some questions that might come up. So we have Maria, who's six years old. She's living in Orange County, Florida, and is taken into protective custody and placed in a non-relative foster home after her mother is detained. 
um, her social worker begins to case plan and through some international family finding, um, finds an aunt uh, in Honduras who's willing and interested in caring for her. Next slide. So we wanted to open this up now just to kind of a five minute chat discussion. I think there's a, there's a lot of people here. So we thought we just, we can put um, your thoughts in the chat and Renee will help lead this discussion as well from her own experience and um, her own advocacy work. So thinking about that very limited information we have about Maria, what, what do you wanna know? If you're working on her case, what do you wanna know? What questions come up for you? What would you do next as her caseworker? Um, what challenges come to mind? Any of those things, start throwing them in the chat and and we can kind of start start getting some feedback. We have a question about pushback from biological parents of children are moved to a country and they're still working on services. Sure. So if the if a child is placed overseas while looking for reunification with a parent here and thinking that's ocean, it's a good kind of get into that. Um, certainly, we like we've kind of both said we would never advocate for moving a child away from their family here um, without knowing that there's a safe home for them in another country. Um, ISS does work on visitation home studies, which could include short-term placements. Um, but I think it gets back to Renee's point of concurrent planning that um, right. if, a, if the primary goal is reunification with a parent here, we would never advocate for, for ending that work, but including international family in, earlier in the process so that we avoid that, that long delay she mentioned. The, the other thing, one minute, Elaine, the other yeah, thing too is we we wouldn't necessarily move the child, but we'd at least start the process to have that as a backup. That if the child cannot be reunified with the parent, if the goal is reunification and the child cannot be reunified with the parent, then at least we know, because we would have 10 times out of 10, we'd get the information on that relative from the parent, right? And the parent would be then given us their contact information is saying, well, if I can't be reunified with my child, I'd like my child to go to India, Guadeloupe, you know. Um, so we would start the process because we don't know how long it's going to take for the other country to get the home approved, not approved, and get the information back to ISS. So we'd at least get the ball rolling so that we have a backup. Um, Alyssa says, has the child ever met the aunt? What does their relationship look like? That's a, that's a big one. I don't know, Megan, if you want to go back up to the slide um, ahead of time, we can get some more. Um, people can read the scenario a little bit and, and keep brainstorming just for a couple more minutes. On, on what else would you want to know? What other questions would you ask? What worries you? Anything come to mind? passport for kids, um, right? So what kind of documentation does she have? Where is dad? Great question, anything else? A couple minutes for people to think about anything else. Or if anybody's worked on a case like this, what were some of the first things you all did? So um, in regards to like a passport, um, you can get, I know in New Jersey, we get, we can get passports court ordered and the passport agencies, if we have custody, then we sign for the passport. We don't need the parent. As long as we have the court order that we have custody of the child, then we're entitled to get the passport for the child. I'm seeing some other really good comments here that I'm noting. So what's the relationship look like? What is what language um, opportunities for mom to stay? How do we, if there is a possibility of moving the child, how do you do that in a way that's prepared so that um, there's less culture shock We're rolling in? <laughs> um, how to build the connection, video chats, letters,
and a comment about um, the Hague Convention with international adoption. So um, Oregon can only place a child in another country with a relative with the plan of adoption. Um, and then let's see if one parent deported the whole family, how do we handle, how do we handle when one parent is supported, what to do with the whole family? Carmen says, hi, Carmen, call the aunt, gather information, start a virtual visit and see if placement is an option. Perfect. All of those are, are great questions and, and valid points. My, again, my concern is do, do we, do we do that? You know, that's, that's the issue. Do we utilize ISS or do we utilize, you know, our resources to do the things that we're asking about? And I think that's, that's the dilemma. Mm -hmm. That's where the biases kick in, you know, because we believe the child is probably best here. So we'll do the bare minimum or we'll wait till we're court ordered to do it and then try to put in a little bit of effort. But we have our own beliefs. Yep, exactly. Um, talking about reunification efforts in, in mom's country of origin, we do lots of parent home studies. So absolutely. Um, how, how are child's medical and, and psychological needs covered? Great. Um, and yes, definitely a lot of questions about passports and working with consulates and, and what happens when a father is unknown. Um, that's a great point, Shania, because we, we are definitely seeing that come up too. It's definitely an in intricacy of this work. So why don't we go to the next slide and we can kind of continue just for the sake of time to keep the conversation going. And actually the next slide um, where I'll talk a little bit oops, about, um, here's a little bit more information just, just for the sake of it. Um, so we know that in this case, she Maria is a US citizen. Um, her family is from Honduras. Her mother came to the United States when she was pregnant with Maria. Her father's whereabouts currently are unknown, and he's not been part of her life. Um, she grew up speaking Spanish. That answers that question. And she spoke frequently with her maternal relatives in Honduras. She has no other family in the U.S., and her mother, who was picked up by immigration officers at a traffic stop, ultimately does receive a removal order. Um, so... There's a lot of things that kind of that were brought up that tap into that. So um, citizenship status and passport status, that does come up in a lot of these cases, though it shouldn't be the end of the, the work. And it sounds like it's not in many cases. Language, um, we know now that Maria does speak Spanish. So that's that often aids. But again, um, being fluent in the language of the other country is not a prerequisite for considering that family. There's a lot of comments about starting video calls and starting to work on that engagement and build the relationship and work on that early on. We know that Maria does have connections in Honduras and not the U.S. Um, so all is to say, I think that this scenario can and probably does look different in a lot of in a lot of cases. If the removal order for mom was for something more serious. Um, if dad is in the picture and what, whether his whereabouts are known or not, if she was not a U.S. citizen, um, there's a lot of, lot of twists and turns of this case that would make it look a little bit different, but fundamentally, this is still somebody who has strong connection to Honduras, and we should be looking at what that family, um, offers, um, and kind of to, to Renee's point earlier, I did make this removal order um, about a traffic stop because we, I do think there is some a tendency to criminalize deportees, um, even when the deportation has nothing to do with a parent as a fit caregiver. It does add some questions to what then that how what is the the resource kind of landscape look like in that country of return if the child is to return with the family, and those are all questions we can start we can work on with you. Next slide. So um, this does bring back the concurrent planning question. So concurrent planning allows us to work towards permanency with family along a range of options, including if you have family options here um, for reunification, um, it doesn't mean we're not working towards that that concurrent planning really means that we can start the work with international family where that exists and where that's possible and where there is that connection, where there's that possible connection. Um, and that this is about equitable access to family. 
um, not about aiding in any kind of removal without really looking at the options. Because again, a family in Honduras should not have less consideration just because they're in Honduras or any other country. Um, if it could offer a child a, a stronger option for safe family permanency. Um, and this is, I think, where we are challenged to put those personal biases aside around making sure we have child and family-centered information that we're working on in our decision making and not relying on assumptions about quality of life or availability of resources in another country. So there are a lot of services we can offer in that respect and we're going to go through them now. Um, you can go to the next slide and then I, I promise we will have time to, to do some questions here at the end and, um, and thank you Danielle for putting some of our services in the chat. Um, so yes, next slide we're going to go through um, some of the services we have and talk through some of the next steps. So this is a this is a slide or a, um, a handout you'll also get in the follow-up. Um, the questions are kind of written, I will say, in a little bit of a biased tone um, or sound a little bit oppositional, and that's not meant to um, suggest how we should be asking these questions, but I think do reflect a little bit of the hesitancy we see in some of this work. Um, so first and foremost, if you don't know where to start, if you can always contact us and we can help kind of put you on the path towards finding some services. We do not charge for technical assistance. We do not charge you to email us. Um, so anytime you do have a question, please just see if we can help. Um, if you don't have communication or engagement with family yet, we can often help with that piece of the process. So we can do, we can often help locate family members in other countries and contact them. We can share documents. We can facilitate their participa participation in court. Um, as Renee mentioned, this often is really helpful when a family member lives in a remote area, might not have great access to Wi-Fi. We can have our international partners help them get to a place where they can they can participate. Um, then kind of moving along the path, if you're looking at, can the, is this family a, a good and safe resource? We can facilitate and obtain home studies for a lot of different cases. Um, as I said, not for adoption, but we can do home studies to help look at short-term placement, long-term guardianship placement, um, placement with a parent, um, and kind of just looking at an, a family's home in that in those cases. Moving further along the path, there are sometimes more specialized or targeted um, resources that you're looking at. And so we do have kind of some services on our list of services for when there are those person or or place specific concerns that wouldn't necessarily fall under information you'd get in a typical home study. So we can do things like help get DNA testing and paternity testing. We can help facilitate um, drug testing in cases that that's necessary in many places. And then we can do something called a community resource assessment, which I'll talk about further in a minute, which is a way to look at the kind of service and resource availability in the area of the child's potential placement or the family's uh, community. So we can go to the next slide. Here are a few other kind of big questions and common questions we get asked. Will the court accept this? And as I mentioned before, there is this perception that um, it, that courts will not, don't understand enough about international placement, might not consider it. Uh, just a reminder that all of our services are being conducted and obtained by professional, um, appropriately credentialed social workers or similar in their country. Um, and so all of these agencies have been vetted by ISS. So they sh if the information is truly coming from child protection and child welfare experts in that place. Um, and it's contextualized to meet the needs of US courts. And then, as I've said many times, we don't have a we don't have a horse in the race or whatever that expression is. We don't this our services are neutral. We're really just trying to provide on the ground child and family specific information. Um, the citizenship question does come up and it does play a role in these cases, as is clear in the chat about the, the passport issues. Um, but as I've said, it should not be the only factor determining the trajectory of permanency planning. Um, 
As I've said, we cannot provide any immigration or legal services, but we can, all of our services can be used for both U.S. citizens or non-U.S. citizens. Um, then we also hear concerns about what happens when there's a decision to place internationally. Um, for us, the we continue to have availability to provide services to support the reception of a child um, in home country. We offer a service called travel uh, coordination assistance, where we our, our team helps work with your team on what the reception needs to look like, who needs to be at the airport, make sure everybody has the availability and resources to get from their home to the airport and go through that process and then get safely home. Um, and then we also have the ability to provide post-placement monitoring. Um, lastly, the, the question of fees always does come up. We do charge for this work. Um, if you are in a state where we have an existing contract, those fees are already established, they're already approved, referrals come to us and we open the, the case through your liaison right away as long as it's a service we can provide. Otherwise, we set up a, a case-specific contractor or a scope of work agreement to work on that on that service. Um, so there is a cost, but there are also savings here, and that is because we have this the, a team at ISS USA and through all of our international partners to take on the work of coordinating, liaising, finding, vetting, getting the work done in the other country, so that you don't have to. Um, your job is to work here with the child on the local stuff, on the pieces that we can't. Uh, so what we offer is to take all of that, that international coordination off your plate. Um, next slide. This is just another kind of look at our services. I won't go through all of them because we've kind of done a lot of them, but you will get a full list of services from us in the in the follow-up to this presentation um, along with the slides, but it's another kind of visual reminder that there's a lot of services in support of permanency planning, more than just home studies. We can't always provide every service in every country all the time. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into that, but our network and the, the breadth of our network really does allow us to do much more than might be accessible through consulates or other channels. And so we just encourage you that if you do have a need related to a child with international family to think about how we might utilize the international network to get those services done. And you'll see here things like um, facilitation of, of in court, um, psychological assessments, DNA testing, and um, paternity testing, all of those services have been added because we started to get requests and questions. And rather than say, no, we can't, we say, let's see if we can. Um, and increasingly, we found that we we have been able to take on some more of the those more complex services. Next slide. So now I'm just going to highlight two services that I think are unique to ISS and that we've seen grow in their usefulness and may also be a good response to some of the things I'm seeing in the chat. Um, the Community Resource Assessment is an ISS specific tool that is both an assessment tool and a planning tool. Um, we developed it to get real time child specific in, and family specific information on a community to which a child would return or be placed. Um, and have seen its usefulness grow in that it really provides the foundation of a service plan. So it get, provides the names and contact information of agencies that are operating in the air, in the community and in the region that can support the family in the event of, um, of placement in that country, whether it's short-term or long-term, um, and really helps stabilize the placement. Since we know much, so much of a successful placement is also about the network and what is there to support and um, keep that child and family safe and together. The community resource assessment allows us to look for those services that are specific to the region and the community and the child and the family to make that happen. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. And the other service that I wanted to talk about is, this, is the work we are doing in return and repeat repatriation specifically for non-citizen children who are returning to a country of origin. 
Um, it's based a, largely on work we did a few years ago when we were reunifying immigrant children after the zero tolerance policy, um, but it helped us really build capacity in a lot of key areas around pre-departure planning, reception support, and post-return services. So there were a number of comments in, in our discussion about how do you work on this before a child goes? How do you build the relationship? How do you prepare for it? And this is kind of our response to that. So we know that there's going to be, there may be a lot of kids who, though we may want this, not want this for them, won't receive an adjusted status here. And so thinking about planning for what a return would look like is not aiding in deportation. Um, it's preparing for a potential outcome and making sure that it if it if it is in the best interest of a child to return, that we're doing, we're, we're planning for that, we're preparing for that, um, and not treating those reunifications differently than we would if it was a reunification here in the US. Um, and we've done a number of these cases in, in Honduras, in Guatemala, recently in Brazil, and we are expanding that into, into many of our other country, um, in working with other country partners. So just as a reminder that that's, it's something to be thinking about in when you have those those cases is, is the, the pre-departure, the reception, and after the return. Next slide. So these are the last handful of slides, just two or three, and then we're going to open it up to discussion in our last 20 minutes. Um, but just to kind of give people a sense of what the process looks like um, in working with our, our office. So if your state or your agency does not have an existing contract with us, there's a few steps that happen before we open your case. Um, so the first step for any, any service, anything you're requesting is to send a referral. So whether you're a contract state or not, um, sending us an email does not open a case. We do need an official referral form. Um, and then the first set of steps that you see there on the left side of the screen are involve our, um, our international service coordinator, who's very helpfully adding some notes here in the chat. Um, but that involves setting up a, a service specific scope of work agreement, um, getting signatures, invoicing for the work, getting payment, and then opening and assigning um, the case. That's when the case is open and it transfers to a case manager, which is on the right side. Um, once the case is opened, each case, oh, I'm sorry, I probably, <laughs> thank you, Megan, <laughs> was on the wrong side. Um, once the case is open, each individual case will have a dedicated case manager who is your main point of contact through the entire service, who is communicating with the international partner, is communicating with you, is answering questions, is providing support, is receiving the report and kind of um, reviewing it for completeness and then sending it over. So um, you will have one, a case manager for every case you have, different from our service coordinator. And then once the service is complete, we close our case. So you can always refer additional, additional services. Um, but for us, a case is a service. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, a few notes on fees, because these do always come up. Things that our fees cover are all of the case management time, both in the US and all of the foreign partners time, their travel, their professional fees, all of those things also covers any fees associated with getting documents or um, any of those um, kind of logistical issues in country. And then the benefits, of course, are that by working with ISS, all of our partners are vetted. They're all child welfare and child protection experts in their country. Um, you don't need to spend time looking for other people to do this work. They're available to take it on. And they also offer the opportunity for some more continuity because it's almost always the same social worker or case worker who is doing all of the services. So if you do end up having a, an international placement, it's almost always going to be that same social worker who's going to the airport, meeting with the family, making sure everything goes well, accompanying them back home, doing the follow-up. So the relationship is established so that there can be that continuity. Next slide. I think it's the last one. Um, I just wanted to run through some frequently asked questions. I mentioned this one service is one case. So you can refer for multiple services at a time, but once cases are 
open, we do need new referrals for each service. So a home study is a service, so that will have a unique case number. A community resource assessment is a um, unique service, its own case number, et cetera. Um, as I've mentioned, we're working with local professionals operating under their own legal and professional guidelines. So we can make requests of them um, in terms of particular um, documents you need or formats, but we cannot compel anybody internationally to work the way we do here. Um, there is no entity that governs these kinds of international, international casework. Um, and so there's an amount of respect we have to have for the sovereignty of other systems and other countries and the way that they do their work. Um, and so that's just something to keep in mind too, that a home study you get from Guatemala may look very different from one you get from Germany, which will look very different from one you get from Canada, et cetera. Um, and that's just part of the nature of international work. Um, and the last one is time. Everybody asks how long does how long does it take? Um, the biggest driver of this is family engagement, the availability of the family to meet with the social worker, respond, um, the availability to physically get to their home. Um, right now, there's some some pretty major demonstrations in Guatemala, and that I will say will most likely delay our ability to do in person work in parts of that country. So things change. Um, but in general, we we do hope to have home studies and, and services around eight weeks, three months or so. Again, we never make promises because it, it does really depend on the country, on the family, on the situation. Um, but we try and, and make these go as quickly as possible. So with that, I'm going to move it over to questions. The last slide, I think, is just a reminder. Um, We'll open it for questions now. If you have other questions that occur to you later, you can always email us at question at iss-usa.org. Um, we definitely re recommend subscribing to our newsletter letter and following us on social media and um, engaging with us as much as you can to, to follow things we're doing. Um, we are about to turn 100. So ISS was founded in 1924. So keep an eye out on uh, for some of those kinds of celebrations. Um, and yeah, I think we'll open it up there for questions on, uh, and I know there's probably some that have been in the chat that I haven't seen. So I can start scrolling there. I see a question. If we're a private agency, would you be able to would we be able to pay you rather than going through the state contract? Yes. So we do not have restrictions on who can send us referrals. Um, it's most often the a state or county office, um, but it is we have no restrictions and are happy to work with in private agencies. And we, we have done that in, in many cases. Thank you, Carmen. We are also helping to work with you. I'm glad to, to see you here, even though I can't see you. Um, let's see, the referral I think has been sent. All of this stuff should be available on our website. Um, as Megan said, the, the slides will be available. Um, okay, they have a question to clarify that ISS can provide home sites for guardianship but not adoption. Is that correct. Um, because you're saying you'd have to get licensed and adoption agencies the earlier system. Yeah, so Addy, I think if I'm understanding your question right, um, because international adoptions are governed by the international treaty under the Hague, if that's the end permanency goal, which is a very, can be the, the very good one, it's best to go through the process and use an accredited agency because if you go through our agency to get a home study, you cannot use it to finalize an adoption. Um, we do have cases where a parent's right is not being terminated, but there's a, a guardianship option in another country and we can facilitate those. We can also help work with our international partners um, to help register court orders in other countries and get all the kind of paperwork in place so that those are, are recognized. Um, 
but we are not an, a licensed accredited adoption agency. And so if, if, if you're in need of an adoption home study or a home study that is going to be used to then apply for an, uh, an adoption in another country, um, we should not be used. That, I hope that answers the question. And if not, you can send me an email. Um, an average case cost. Um, so our services vary depending on what the service is um, and depending on if you have a contract with us or not. I can say that an, an international home study is, um, again, unless there's some kind of separate arrangement worked out, is $5,000. Um, and again, that's inclusive of everything. Um, other services, again, there's, um, if you send us an email, we can kind of start working with you on what your needs are and, and how we can accommodate them. Um, but oftentimes home studies in particular, um, we've heard again, we're not expert on this can be reimbursed through, um, title 40 funds. If it's a U.S. citizen child or a, um, a resident. Um, something about all cases go through the U.S. General Consulate to work with the receiving country. So it's not the U.S. General Consulate. We have a we have a general secretariat um, at the ISS International Social Service General Secretariat, um, headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, and they, as the network, are responsible for vetting all of our the the formal partners and official um, entities that we work with internationally. Um, and so ISS USA is a member of the ISS network as are many of the other country partners. So um, the vetting doesn't take place by a US government entity. It takes place by an, a nonprofit um, NGO part, you know, ISS as an NGO. I hope that clarifies that one. Um, and I don't know if I'm missing any. Or if anybody saw questions further up. Um, Angelica or Angelica, I don't, I hope I'm saying your name right. It's, it reminds people that other countries may allow dual citizenship, so a child doesn't lose U.S. citizenship, but importantly, that it does depend on the country and what they do or do not allow. And I think the, thank you for putting that in. And I think it's a really good reminder that if you're working on these cases, looking at the consulate of the country that you'd be looking into it's that's where they're going to have information on immigration on kind of what services would be available to a child with different statuses if they were to go to another country um every country is different the way that their immigration system works is different the way visas work is different the way um people different people with different statuses are eligible for services and so Consulting with consulates is absolutely a really important step anytime you're working on these cases. Um, working with us is just one piece of the kind of service profile you have. Um, and yes, this US State Department has very good information. Um, I see another question. Let's see. Shane asks, Renee, do you have a tip sheet to help guide case managers with best practices when working with international families? A tip sheet, do everything that you would do here, you do there. And utilize ISS and any other consulate. I would also suggest we are we are our biggest network, right? So when you are when you're working a case that is from another country or Try to tap into your colleagues, try to tap into, you know, staff members that may be from that country and they can tell you about, um, you know, I know again here in New Jersey, 
a lot of the international uh, communities have their own organizations that, you know, that you can go to and ask questions, you know, so tap into your, your local resources, but start within, start within your agency. We don't use each other like we should. There is a question here too about what international search engines are used for family search and engagement. Um, I don't use a particular one. There may be country specific ones. Um, yeah, there we go, Daniel. <laughs> Already responded. Um, but to reiterate, our on the ground partners do use their own kind of local search methods. Uh, we've had cases where um, our social workers will go to a local you know, their, their municipal office will go to their, you know, registration, population registration building. So we do typically need more information than a name. Um, but as kind of Renee was saying, also use, keep, keep asking and finding creative ways to get information. Kids know more than sometimes I think we give them credit for. Social media is a huge tool that we can we might want, not want to over rely on, but um, people are a lot easier to find these days than I think probably ever in history. Um, and so getting some basic information on where where somebody used to live or a relative might have lived, um, you know, we don't need a full address and phone number, obviously, to trace somebody, but we do typically need more than their name, um, their first name. So we can work with you to figure out what additional information on a country specific level we would need to, to do that locating. Um, but it, it's kind of country to country how they do it. Um, we have another question from Addy. Anytime I've encountered the topic of international family members of youth that I know, it sounds from our state workers that our state can't even look at placement out of country. Is it set up where specific counties and states determine that? Um, that would that would be strange to me. Um, I think that there's there are certain policies that kind of discourage it. But it shouldn't be um, it shouldn't be unallowable, um, especially given how how many potential cases there are. I don't know, Renee, if you from your network have other thoughts on that. But um, yeah, that's news to me. I've I, I've never um, in any of my travels or any of my contacts with other states, I've never heard that before. That's very um, Unusual is considering considering how we're moving toward um, more towards kin and family, you know, and away from adoption um, as social services agencies child protection. It's very it would be very odd that we would, you know, count out completely count out kin and family out of the country. I think, I mean, that might be a good way. I know we're kind of creeping towards the end of this session, but um, as kind of a last plug and advocacy point is that if that's what you're hearing, it's worth pushing back on that because it shouldn't, that should not be the case. And it may be part of what's feeding some of the lack of confidence and lack of understanding is that if you hear from one person at some point that something's not allowed, how does that impact how you work on an individual kid's case? Um, and so kind of being, being the one to ask some more questions and looking, kind of digging into that a little bit more and um, being curious about why that is or if where that's coming from, I think could be a really powerful position. Um, I know that, I know, um, Renee, that's one of the things that I love about presenting with Renee is that like Renee is this huge advocate of, wait a minute, why are we doing that? Why why does this kid get it this way? And this kid gets it as a different way because their parent is in Haiti. Um, and so I think part of what part of the work of all of us is to ask those questions. Why is that a policy? Can I see it? Where does that come from? What does that mean? Um, 
does it have to be that way, especially when we know there are so many resources to, or at least some resources to, to, to do better. Um, and that's kind of my thought on, on that. Yeah. Present. Yeah. Um, you know, when we can, we can also support that. So if you, we can send letters and information about who we are and how we work, um, as part of due diligence to show what's available to court. Um, we do get court orders for home studies and other things going down from lots of states. So it's, um, it is possible. Um, and I would, I would definitely encourage some further exploration of where that, what that policy is. Anything else, Kate, or anybody that you've seen higher up that I've missed them, missed something, or if I haven't answered your question, um, you can repost it or, or send it to me. I do want to thank everybody for staying on for the. I know a 90 minute webinar is a long, is a long one, but um, I hope we've, I hope we've shared some good information. I think I'll turn it back over to Kate, um, but I do encourage you if you have questions for me, if you have questions in general about work you're doing to please, uh, please send us an email. We'd love to hear from you and, and happy to help in, in any way we can. Thanks so much, Thank Elaine and Renee for sharing about all this wonderful work. Um, so everybody, we hope you enjoyed today's webinar and we will look forward to hearing uh, your feedback in the evaluation survey. And again, you will get an email that has a link to this recording and to the PowerPoint slides um, and a couple other really handy tools Elaine and uh, Renee created for us. So you'll get that um, within a couple of days after the webinar and that will also have your certificate of attendance. Uh, so thanks again so much and everyone have a great afternoon.